honored guest, um, Irina Bokova, um, previously director and always director general of UNESCO from my perspective um, uh, and uh, for many people in the world. We, we have a wonderful and distinguished guest with us today. Um, many of you know of her and may have met her um, earlier on and, and some other location, whether virtually or in person. Um, I'm going to start with a, a fairly formal introduction and then I'm going to make some personal remarks um, as well. Um, Irina Bokova um, will be speaking today. There, there were a couple of different titles floated, but just so you know, her topic today is on UNESCO and its role in global education, how we can and must move forward. She's given many different talks and earlier we had her, uh, we had a, a somewhat different, um, very related talk about the future of the United Nations, which, and UNESCO's role, which I hope will also come into today's conversation. These are not, these are complementary ideas, just to say. So Irina Bokova, as you uh, probably know, uh, was born and raised in uh, Bulgaria and she did serve two uh, terms as Director General of UNESCO based in Paris from 2009 to 2017. Um, and she was the first woman to lead the organization. Um, she graduated from Moscow State Institute of International Relations, was a fellow at the University of Maryland, um, and uh, followed an executive program at the JFK School um, in, uh, at Harvard University. She began her career in the United Nations Department of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bulgaria, her home country, elected twice to parliament, served as the first deputy minister of foreign affairs and government and the first secretary of European affairs. I mentioned these, these are details that um, maybe not everybody would mention, but the, the, her diplomatic skills will come back, I think not only in my introduction, but also in what she says today. Um, before being elected Director General of UNESCO, she was Ambassador of Bulgaria to France, Monaco, and UNESCO, and the personal representative of the President of Bulgaria to the uh, French, uh, the Francophonie, the uh, Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, the French-speaking countries uh, of the world. Um, as you would already know, uh, she, as part of her role as Director General of UNESCO, uh, she was deeply involved in the development of and the activities related to the sustainable development goals and uh, especially related to today's conversation, goal number four, you're all aware of on inclusive and equitable quality of education and learning for all. Um, and she took a special interest uh, as probably you also know in gender equality and the protection of the world's cultural heritage, which she was alluding to a moment ago. Um, she is uh, a prominent person in the world, world affairs. She has been uh, listed on the world's, on the list of Forbes list of the most influential women. Um, she was also recently last year elected international honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, so that's part of her official biography. Um, the less formal biography, uh, I'd like to add a few words about. One, and I think this is really key, is she is the most humble and approachable leader in the United Nations that I've ever encountered. She cares. And you will know that even in this virtual Zoom call, you will have seen it if you've ever met her or when you have a chance to meet her, you will notice the same thing. She is um, so open-minded, such a learner in the spirit of learning that we all care about, I think, at the University of Pennsylvania uh, on so many different topics. It's just um, incredible. In fact, I don't know how we're going to be able to even hear more than a small sample of what she can present to us in uh, the short, uh, uh, Zoom uh, presentation today. Um, also important, and you might find it surprising that a woman of her distinction 
has found the time to talk to all of us, really mainly a class of students, graduate students, a few faculty, uh, but taking the time away from uh, her many other major international responsibilities. She may tell you that she just got off another Zoom on climate change and the role of women in climate change, a UN sponsored conference. I mean, we're up against that kind of competition. And it isn't just, and I will say this, that she has a fondness for the University of Pennsylvania, that she has a fondness for you, the students on this call. And she cares about this notion of generativity and trying to make sure that if you have opportunities to try to be actors in the world, to try to make the world a better place, she wants to reach you. And for her to find this time in a, in a, a Zoom exhausting world, I, I really so appreciate it. And I hope that you will as well. I'm sure you will. Um, and I did allude to the fact that she's a friend of Penn. Um, I think we probably hold the honor. Uh, don't, don't correct me, Irina. I may be wrong, but I think you've been to Penn either personally or virtually more than almost any university, maybe except from your home country or maybe in the United States. But it isn't easy to get here from Paris and to find the time to come and talk with you all both directly and uh, now virtually. It is, it is such a pleasure. And um, you reminded me, um, uh, Madame Bokova, of, uh, of our own uh, last, uh, I think, well, maybe we saw each other at a conference somewhere, but in your last visit, I think, to Penn, the, where you were a real person as opposed to a virtual person. I've seen you virtually numerous times, but you also were here at the launch of my book, and you wrote the foreword to my book, Learning as Development. Some of you have, have seen that book or read parts of that book. And for the Director General of UNESCO to make an effort to launch a book of which, you know, she has so many contacts with so many different people, to come back to Penn, give a talk, launch the book, hold a debate about the book here on campus at the Penn Bookstore. It seems like a long time ago, it was only a few years ago uh, before we had COVID uh, shut us down. Anyway, on a personal level, I am so grateful for that moment and grateful to have you with us again. So I'm gonna stop there. You could see I could go on a while longer, but I will, I will hold my further comments. I will open it up to you, uh, Madame Bokova, uh, our arrangement for this was about 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and then open it up for Q&A. I already have some of your questions. Uh, some of you submitted some questions. I've picked a few. I will start with those. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box. I will try to look at it. Dr. Gershberg will also be uh, looking at uh, uh, your questions in the chat box or comments as well and feeding them back into the comfort conversation. Thank you, Dr. Gershberg. I see you there. And um, so I think with no further ado, we are going to talk about UNESCO and its role in global education. Welcome. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, thank you very much for your very generous uh, and kind presentation. And um, as you said, for me, it's uh, coming back to Penn, where I have been many times uh, before, both in my capacity as Director General of UNESCO, uh, but even when I stepped down uh, and I remember uh, very vividly the presentation of a book uh, that um, you have written. I have it with me. I just want to once again to show it because this is the way also I prepared uh, for this uh, important uh, conversation uh, today. Um, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, I'm here. I could talk about uh, UNESCO. I could talk about uh, uh, the, what is happening in the world nowadays, uh, because unfortunately, uh, as we were supposed to celebrate uh, last year, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, the 75th fifth anniversary of UNESCO, and unfortunately, we couldn't uh, do it uh, because of the pandemic. But it once again reminds me about uh, the role uh, multilateral system, uh, uh, United Nations and UNESCO, of course, uh, uh, have contributed uh, to peace, to development, to human rights, which are the three pillars of, of the UN. Um, and also, it reminded me uh, about uh, both my years at UNESCO, well before that, and everything that this uh, wonderful organization has contributed to humanity. And I know that with you, we are sharing the same passion because you have been and you are still a UNESCO uh, chair uh, for literacy and for development. I think this is a uh, um, uh, this is a very important for learning and, and literacy. I think this is an important moment also to speak about education and learning. 
Now, let me start uh, once again with something very important, UNESCO's constitution. I just want to say that uh, and to encourage everybody, all the, the students uh, to look once again at the UNESCO constitution, which probably is the most, uh, the most poetic, the most uh, comprehensive uh, in terms of values uh, uh, document of the United Nations system adopted in 1945, which uh, starts by the words famous already, since wars start in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace, peace must be constructed. This is the great idea that time strongly supported uh, by the United States. And these words were, uh, this first phrase was penned by Alistair MacLeish at that time, the, uh, the poet, a librarian of Congress, uh, which showed exactly that peace can be founded and constructed, achieved differently. I think it is very, very important notion, uh, even today when uh, we are looking at different ways to uh, defend uh, once again uh, peace, um, uh, to see whether uh, what UNESCO is doing and this approach is relevant in the different times, the times of globalization, of connectivity, of interdependence. I would argue that this is even more important today, particularly because of the current crisis, the global pandemic, with all the unprecedented consequences, uh, political, economic, social, humanitarian, and I would say ethical. The devastating result of this pandemic, which is about shrinking economies, uh, job opportunities, uh, rising inequalities, uh, surge in poverty, both in the uh, developing world, but also in the developed world, uh, the emerging food insecurity. Uh, all of this has a dangerous impact uh, on the efforts uh, to ensure a sustainable path of development. And as the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Antonio Gutierrez, said during the recent uh, General Assembly session, uh, he said that uh, the world may be going back 25 years in its development and many, many achievements um, will be pushed back. Uh, another consequence of the pandemic is that it showed once again how interdependent our world is and how much humanity needs this type of multilateral platforms to look for common solutions. And of course, definitely UNESCO is one of those important international platforms. Just a month ago, uh, in December 2020, the United Nations General Assembly also hosted another important event, which was dedicated to the fifth anniversary of the Paris Climate Agreement. And uh, what is mentioned, what was mentioned in the important decision is the follows. The climate emergency is fully upon us and we have no time to waste. It was uh, strongly emphasized by, once again, the Secretary General Gutierrez. The answer to our existential crisis is swift, decisive, scaled up action, and solidarity among nations. It is time to make peace with nature, time to flick the green switch, where the appropriate global response, transformation of the world economy, building a sustainable system driven by renewable energy, green jobs, and resilient future is a must. I think, and I would very much uh, congratulate the United States, the new administration that have announced, has announced that the US is coming fully back to the Paris Climate Agreement. I think this is extremely important for the world. It's important for the American people, but for humanity as a whole. So against this general background, I would like to make three important points which are linked to the specific topic of our discussion. First, is that we need to reconfirm our commitment to sustainable development and the Agenda 2030 with education and health at its heart. While we know that the United Nations SDGs was, they were already an aspirational endeavor and that some SDG targets may need to be redefined, others may not be achieved, maybe entirely out of reach because of the pandemic, but the goals remain a critical framework for cooperation. The importance of the goals, if anything, is reinforced exactly by the pandemic. The crisis has served as a wake-up call to put human security and well-being to the forefront of public policies. If the work of the day is not just building back, but to building back better, one sure path is investing in people, in economies and societies that are clean, green, healthy, safe, and more resilient. And this is where the importance of goal number four, 
of sustainable development agenda, promoting inclusive and equitable quality education and lifelong learning for all comes with all its critical importance for the future. We all know that education plays an important multifaceted role in the new global development agenda, which strives to eradicate poverty, address social needs such as uh, health, uh, gender equality, social protection, job opportunities, environmental protection. But I believe nowadays with the COVID pandemic, we are seeing the importance, the huge importance of education for the sustainable development agenda. Because if you look at all the targets of the uh, SDG uh, number four, and I'm not going to read it, I know that you know uh, all of this. Uh, I think what is at its heart is inclusion, equity, and quality. Uh, and these are the three pillars of the uh, SDG four that come now with all its force because exactly of the pandemic, because of inequalities, because of the threatening, uh, of alarming, I would, uh, I would say a development of going back into the achievement of these, of these goals. The importance of uh, uh, all the different uh, elements uh, here, uh, I think is uh, more than obvious uh, now that we see a huge investment, uh, public investment to, to overcome the crisis. And um, if we see that uh, the uh, huge public investment that is being done in the very many of the uh, developed countries of trillions of dollars, only less than 1% of these trillions of dollars of fiscal investment go to education. And I think this really is something that should be a very big concern of us. It represents in real terms, 91 uh, uh, billion dollars. And of this 91 billion dollars, 73 billion are in the high income countries. So the disparities, which was the aim of goal number four, particularly for education, instead of shrinking, bridging the disparities and the gap is widening. And this is something that is a big worry, of course, for me, and I guess for uh, very many, very many people. Now, um, if I uh, go back a little bit uh, to the uh, contribution of uh, UNESCO, and if I go back to uh, some of the uh, lessons uh, that have been learned uh, from the Millennium Development Goals and then the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, this continuity uh, that, uh, that is happening. Uh, uh, I see uh, in very many of the uh, examples that we have, uh, leadership, I would say, examples uh, that uh, UNESCO has provided through launching of different concepts, uh, uh, a very important responsibility of the organization. Of course, uh, uh, I may go back uh, to the two reports uh, at that time, the four report in the uh, 80s and then in the 90s, uh, the report of uh, uh, um, a very important report, report of uh, the UNESCO, the law report, the UNESCO uh, education, the treasure within. Uh, I think there are a lot of good building blocks uh, and then of course the sustainable development goals. Uh, and now it's the time where we really need to rethink uh, this uh, approach uh, of education based on the important pillars uh, in order to look at the current state of affairs, the uh, learning, the learning crisis that we are confronting even before the pandemic, uh, the inequalities that are on the rise, uh, the need uh, to uh, ensure uh, sustainability uh, in, all, in all our efforts, the inequalities, which unfortunately within countries and among uh, between countries uh, are, are increasing, and to look at also at the impact of the new technologies uh, on education, to look at uh, everything that uh, um, artificial intelligence can bring, or the different digital platforms, and how we may leverage these uh, huge advancement of science and technology, and to make it work for quality, for inclusiveness, and for equity. I think we should not lose sight of the fact that these are the basic prerequisites of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, our ambitions when it comes to education and uh, goal, goal number four. Now, uh, from that point of view, uh, I would like uh, uh, just to make uh, a, few, a few points. Uh, 
Um, in the, um, once again, uh, when, as I say, uh, when we speak about the uh, sustainable development goal number four, there are very many firsts uh, in this uh, uh, goal number four. We know that uh, for the first time, uh, there were uh, recognition of uh, secondary education, both stage of, uh, stages of education, primary and secondary. Uh, we have seen, of course, uh, compulsory, nine years of compulsory studies. Uh, we have seen a lot of emphasis on the, uh, the gender equality, the equality between uh, girls and boys in higher education. We have seen also for the first time putting an emphasis on technical vocational training for the first time on tertiary education, higher education. It was also a big opening of looking at the education system in all its uh, uh, coherence. And I think this, this is very important. Um, and of course, to promote lifelong learning, which uh, is a concept uh, very strongly embedded uh, also, uh, I think in your book, Learning as Development, I think this is very important because education and learning starts becomes more and more a lifelong experience in the new uh, economy that is, uh, that is emerging and that is being built. And from that point of view, I would like just to say a few words about universities, because universities indeed have a growing responsibility to translate the global sustainable development goals to local circumstances. And I would say currently with the COVID-19 pandemic to build back better. Universities and higher education institutions uh, uh, in all their, through their research, learning, teaching, campus operations, leadership, I would say, in their communities uh, uh, are really the one that can teach students to uh, and contribute to them solving complex problems, problems that are of sustainable development nature. And I think this is the time to look at uh, higher education and, uh, and science, of course, the bridge as a drivers of true transformation. Because in cooperation with the decision makers, with the private sector, the civil society, they could explore different uh, sustainable uh, pathways. Uh, and of course, uh, support a lot and, and prepare young students for uh, social innovation that is so much needed uh, nowadays. So um, at the end of the day, uh, I would say that uh, the universities uh, in some way go back to their initial uh, kind of function when they were they started uh, in the Middle Ages somewhere in Europe, uh, maybe in China and other parts of the world, because at the end of the day, they were created in order to serve society and community and to prepare young people to live nowadays in a globalized world. So uh, it is kind of giving back to society. This is what universities. And from that point of view, I see this role in two dimensions, which should not be contradictory in my, in my view to one another. It's on one side fostering skills for achieving the uh, 17 uh, development goals, and also to respond to the emerging challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. Universities should teach um, young people uh, uh, to be global citizens in a world that is changing and transforming with unprecedented speed. And um, I would say um, teaching them in the critical thinking, in curiosity, while at the same time embracing change. I know it's, it's a race against time, but this is uh, what uh, the uh, changing world around us is demanding from from universities, uh, because it education, and I think uh, all here know uh, much better than me, it's not about transferring knowledge of one generation to another. Uh, it's rather about the ability of young people to make choices and to make choices while having the right uh, ethical uh, attitudes and values, uh, 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 right set of values and ethics. And I think uh, the sustainable uh, development uh, should form part of this value system and ethical system. So my second point is about uh, technology. It's about uh, technology, the digital uh, and education. Because today when we speak about the fusion of technologies that is blurring the line between the physical, digital and biological sphere, uh, there is an increasing need of um, higher education also to search for responses for both their positive, I would say economic and uh, social environmental impact, uh, uh, as well as the challenges they represent uh, to us. So um, many experts, and I do agree uh, with them, I have been uh, 
very interested uh, in, in this topic, uh, they insist that effective education strategy must include in equal measure a deep consideration of the human, the ways in which uh, technologies and all this shifting uh, economic power impacts people of all socioeconomic uh, levels and backgrounds, and the threats that exist within a world which is increasingly interconnected. Uh, from that point of view, uh, if you allow me, I just uh, want to mention uh, something which probably is not very directly linked to this uh, uh, the topic, but I think it's important. Um, I, I know that UNESCO has been uh, very closely linked uh, with the prominent uh, French philosopher of the 20th century, Claude Lévi-Strauss, who at that time influenced the thinking about race, ethnicity, culture, and diversity. And he famously said when he was thinking about the linkages between social and natural sciences, uh, uh, which nowadays is very high on the topic of education, educators and thinkers, he famously said, recommending the unification of methodological thinking between the exact sciences and the human sciences, the, he said, the speculations of the earliest geometers and arithmeticians were concerned with men far more than with the physical world. Pythagoras, for one, was deeply interested in the anthropological significance of numbers and figures. Equally now with computers and digital, I think we are equally uh, interested in the impact that it has on us. As were the, uh, the sages of China, India, pre-colonial pre Africa and pre-Columbian Colombian America, which were preoccupied with the meaning and specific attributes of numbers. So if it was true in the world well centuries before us, now I think it's even more relevant to what we are thinking with this unprecedented advances of science and technology. So one fundamental question that nowadays stays in front of us, which all uh, look for answers is, has the COVID-19 pandemic changed education forever? Uh, the rise of e-learning, whereby teaching is undertaken remotely on digital platforms in an unprecedented manner, does it mean that these changes uh, have caused my might be here to stay? And from that point of view, what are the lessons for the future if you want to keep education as a powerful social mobility vehicle that narrows the inequality gaps and as the strongest transformational force in the world? I think here we should look on one side at what is happening with the digital space in the world. We should know that half of the world's population, half of humanity does not have access to internet. And I think this really is one of the biggest gaps that humanity has allowed to happen that impedes development on all the different levels. I would say it impedes our fight against climate change, it impedes even peace and security in many parts of the world. So what is very important is to close the digital divide. And I think here, there should be some very forward looking strategies. Uh, uh, the access to internet nowadays uh, becomes uh, part and should become part of our um, set of uh, human rights issues because it is vital for health, it is vital for education, it is vital for economy for inclusion, for everything. So we have to look at the digital divide all also from the point of view, not just in the those countries that do not have access to internet, but also in the high income countries. Because what uh, the digital trans the transition to a digital learning in, in many parts has shown that if you have a fast internet, if you have a quality internet, if you have the environment, uh, family environment on others that is supportive of, uh, of your efforts, of course you will excel uh, in school. So we have to look at all this impact. On the other side, I think once again, the digital is an extraordinary tool, of course, uh, for learning, but we should not forget that schooling is also a social venue. It's a place where children, learn how to socialize, that learn how to, some values, they learn how to behave with the others, they learn to respect each other, they learn to work in teams with each other, they learn how to be curious together, uh, how to explore together. And I think 
the future, in my view, should be a hybrid form. They should be, uh, of course, uh, based on the uh, digital opportunities uh, that are, but uh, at the same time, we should not neglect what is also uh, another, I would say, uh, uh, responsibility of education. And last, and I finish with that, uh, so that we would have time, of course, to uh, probably uh, discuss more. Um, I would like uh, uh, here to say that uh, 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 coming back also to UNESCO's contribution, uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, nowadays UNESCO is uh, very active uh, in all the launches of their uh, new types of uh, projects and programs uh, uh, in, the, in, the difficult, in the different areas. Uh, uh, UNESCO is working uh, on uh, being a famous laboratory of ideas, um, as we know, within the United Nations system uh, and wider. Uh, some were calling at those times, UNESCO is the conscious of humanity. Um, I think it's very important that this type of intellectual debate uh, within UNESCO uh, continues. I'm happy that uh, uh, it continues uh, because the, uh, today when we speak about uh, both uh, uh, education and uh, building back better, we should uh, not forget uh, a very important target of goal number four. And this uh, important target of goal number four is target number seven. It's about global citizenship education. It is about values. Uh, it is about uh, education indeed uh, is the foundation of, uh, uh, of, of human beings, of human behavior. And this is where introducing uh, in curricular, introducing in the education system very firmly, I would say, uh, embedded uh, uh, this sense of uh, cultural diversity, of mutual respect, um, of knowledge about the others, of human rights, uh, of caring about the environment, uh, of climate uh, uh, education uh, also equally, of caring about the uh, biodiversity, uh, of empathy, of solidarity towards the others, I think are uh, extremely important. And with the COVID-19, um, I believe um, this is coming to the forefront uh, because of all the big debate of how we as humanity uh, overcome and fight uh, this pandemic. Uh, because I'm more than confident that nobody is safe until everybody is safe. And this is uh, uh, something, uh, something very, very important. Uh, ethics uh, and education, as I said, uh, is uh, a very important uh, part of, should be a very important part uh, uh, into the education systems. And I'm very, very happy that uh, apart from all the other contribution that UNESCO uh, has been doing during its 75 years, uh, uh, either uh, with the uh, launching of uh, major uh, new innovative ideas, of course, education for all, knowledge-based societies, uh, expression of cultural diversity, ethics of science, um, ethics of climate change, uh, the famous declaration that UNESCO adopted uh, in 2017, my last general conference of UNESCO before I stepped down. And now UNESCO is working on the ethics of artificial intelligence. I think all of this uh, kind of building blocks of an approach of UNESCO towards uh, uh, more uh, higher uh, intellectual thinking uh, is, uh, is extremely important. And uh, UNESCO has always been a leader uh, in uh, very many of the documents that are still very, very relevant. I'm speaking about the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights adopted in 97. And I would recommend uh, maybe some of the students who are interested to look at that. Uh, the International uh, Declaration on Human Genetic Data, the Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights uh, adopted in 2005. All of this are extremely important now when we see this unprecedented uh, development of technology. And um, what comes to my mind uh, when speaking about this uh, side of it uh, is of course uh, another um, verse of UNESCO's constitution, which I think is uh, very relevant and probably my, my, uh, my favorite one, which says that a peace based exclusively upon the political and economic arrangements of governments would not be a peace which could secure the unanimous, lasting and sincere support of peoples of the world. Peace must be founded, if it is not to fail, upon the intellectual and moral solidarity of mankind. So I would end with this uh, uh, phrase and um, 
maybe we could, uh, I'm ready to respond to questions or engage in a conversation. Or maybe somebody will not be in agreement with me. I'm ready to listen. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, many questions arise. I actually, as I mentioned, I have a few all, already from some of the students and some are going on chat. Um, I'd like to start my, um, and ask you a question, sort of a direct follow-up on you. I, I get this question from students over many years, including the, some of the people on this call, is um, how, do, how does a student like many of those on the screen in front of us today become you? How did, and let me preface that by saying, how did you become you? When you were growing up, did you envision ever being a senior UN official? And could you mention one or two turning points that allowed you maybe to become who the you that you are today? Because um, it's hard for many of us to imagine that kind of pathway. If you don't mind sharing a few thoughts. Well, um, I think there were probably a couple of, of, of moments uh, which, uh, which uh, really uh, uh, are important. Now that you asked me this question, going back, uh, I have to say I, I, I never thought that um, I, I would be elected. Um, I didn't have, uh, to be very frank, this ambition uh, uh, the very beginning. Uh, even when I came to uh, Paris as an ambassador to uh, UNESCO, um, I didn't think for different reasons. Uh, there has never been a woman, I'm from a small country. So it's uh, all different kind of considerations. But um, once I uh, saw the opportunity and I believed in this um, and I, I love UNESCO for uh, decades um, uh, because in my, um, in my childhood, I wanted to become an archeologist. I was very much, I, uh, I think the best, uh, I wanted to discover new worlds, uh, to discover new cultures. I thought uh, always that uh, uh, living in a multicultural environment, knowing about the others, respecting is the best thing a human being can do in this world. Uh, uh, so, uh, and I have a fantastic teacher. This is the role of teachers of history. Uh, and this is where uh, in school, I think um, half of my classmates became historians. I thought of uh, becoming an archaeologist. Finally, I ended up uh, with the diplomacy, international relations, but I, I immediately thought that uh, multilateralism and UN is probably the best thing that um, uh, humanity has, has created. And kind of it, um, it evolved. Uh, it became um, natural uh, for me. But maybe uh, this, um, I would say, desire uh, for learning uh, came from my mother, like, uh, uh, because my mother was a typical child of the war. Uh, she was a dropout after primary education, uh, poor family, uh, couldn't go, couldn't continue, started working, and it was only after the war. Already married with two kids, she went to an evening classes, um, graduated secondary education, uh, went to university, uh, studied medicine, uh, made a PhD, and became a scientist. So, my childhood memories, and you know, during COVID, I was looking at archives, everybody was looking at uh, photos and family archives. I saw a lot of photos where my mother is studying and I'm studying. So, this was my these were my recollections uh, from uh, in the evenings from, from my childhood. So you kind of provoked me a little bit on a personal level. So this is how is it. And of course, I would like to mention that the uh, changes, the democratic changes in Bulgaria, of course, uh, were something very important in the life of my generation. It's something, uh, you know, uh, um, just uh, destroying uh, the Berlin Wall and uh, unifying Europe. Uh, it either happens in one generation or it doesn't happen at all. So I think my generation was lucky to have it and a lot more of opportunities, of course, were open. So yeah, so this was my, my story. Well, um, thank you. And I, I know there are probably many other aspects of that story that if we had time and had a cup of tea, all of us together, it would be interesting to explore. But I, I want to follow up with one specific question that people have uh, asked me over time, but I've never asked you. Um, and that is, usually when you think of the major UN agencies, the leaders come from the United States, China, Russia, big countries. Uh, Bulgaria is not a big country. Um, 
what were the pros and cons of being Bulgarian in a UN system? Any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, you know, the, the beauty of the, um, of the UN uh, and the beauty of UNESCO for that matter, UNESCO doesn't have a security council. So uh, it's, uh, from that point of view, it's much more democratic. Um, I think the beauty of this, uh, it, it is that um, there are, in my view, and I have always said it, there are no big and small countries. There are countries really uh, can contribute uh, to this uh, uh, debate, uh, to this intellectual leadership, uh, and then uh, everybody can lead if you have the right ideas, uh, if, you had, uh, if you have the right approach. Um, uh, actually, when, when, when I was elected in uh, 29, um, it was a time after the financial crisis, um, elections at UNESCO, and each one of the candidates uh, had to prepare a, a vision, some, the 2000 words famous, a vision for, um, for UNESCO. And mine, I was very much thinking that um, mine was entitled um, uh, UNESCO in the 21st century, New Humanism for a Globalized World. I thought at that time that um, the financial crisis uh, with its impact uh, is bringing something really that may destroy the fabric of societies. We may lose sight of uh, what is very important. Uh, gladly, the world overcame uh, further and the United Nations more mobilized and uh, around the sustainable development goals. Um, I was really lucky. I was privileged to be at that time a director general of UNESCO because I could participate in very many of the debates. Actually, UNESCO has a relevance to nine, uh, direct relevance to nine out of the 17 sustainable development goals. And I do believe this is the most humanistic still uh, vision for humanity. Um, as I said, we may not achieve everything. We may have to adjust. We may have to um, look at uh, some of the targets, but there is no other framework uh, for, for us to have a sustainable, sustainable future. Uh, so from that point of view, I was indeed very, very privileged uh, to be there. And I didn't feel any difference whether I'm from this country or from another. Uh, thank you for that. It's so interesting. I never hear you ask that question. So I think this is <laughs> <laughs> the first time I've ever heard a response to that. So we have a question that follows directly on what you were saying, I think, about UNESCO. Uh, Keiko Yamada is, I think, on this call. Um, and she asked a question about the role, um, a number of pieces of it. Keiko, I'm going to call on you in just a moment. Um, actually, you're not on my, can you raise your hand? I actually okay, don't see you. Wonder. Okay, hi. Uh, so uh, the question uh, that I'd like you to focus on, uh, part of your question is on the role of UNESCO in, as part of the United Nations. Uh, um, maybe you could say it in your own words, because I think that question is really relevant to us. Uh, the Director General has just talked about UNESCO's role, but how did it, how did, what's, what was your question in relation to the multilateralism? Certainly. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this space and time with us and for all your insights. I think we all very much appreciate it. I was wondering, um, with your emphasis on multilateralism and the need for this world movement, how UNESCO, and UN organizations can contribute to that from the inside, or if you see that there's a need for change that's from the outside or changing those certain organizations. In other words, how are we to contribute to that and how does the UN contribute to that movement? It's a very interesting, uh, very interesting question, uh, Keiko. Thank you for that. Um, first, um, I would like to say that um, we have to have in mind that UN and UNESCO, for that matter, is intergovernmental. Um, it is uh, decisions taken by governments. It's uh, universal. Well, currently, unfortunately, not uh, because the United States and Israel are not members. But uh, I'm talking about UNESCO. For for other reasons, but uh, it is uh, governments that are taking decisions, all governments. You may pass judgments on different governments, uh, but uh, uh, this is a broad platform of uh, discussions. And the difficulty sometimes uh, is uh, to make all these uh, governments agree on a certain agenda, to agree on certain policies that then 
they have to implement themselves. Now, when it comes to relations between uh, UNESCO and the UN, UN system, what we, what we call, is the United Nations and all the different uh, funds, programs, and agencies. With the funds and programs, you know that they are part of the United Nations. They are not, uh, from that point of view, intergovernmental. That have, they have a lot more uh, liberty, a lot more leeway uh, to act. And I'm talking uh, about um, UNDP, UNICEF, uh, UNEP, and some others. Of course, they have a governance uh, mechanism, but the, I would say the link between the governments and uh, their project implementation is a little bit longer than what UNESCO has. UNESCO is a strictly intergovernmental organization. At the same time, I would say it's a challenge, but it is also a great opportunity because UNESCO is the one organization within the UN which has the widest possible outreach to the civil society to the uh, NGOs, universities, through university chairs, UNESCO centers, uh, national centers under the auspices of UNESCO, um, and also all the other uh, different networks that UNESCO has, museums, World Heritage Sites, Creative Cities Network, Cities Against Racism, just to mention but a few. And this gives an opportunity of UNESCO to go a little bit beyond the strictly intergovernmental nature and to work for the promotion of the same ideas that we are uh, talking here. Uh, and of course, one of the, uh, I would say, responsibilities of UNESCO and the Director General of UNESCO is to work with the other agencies, uh, with the other partners within the UN system, and also to sometimes to convince the uh, people in New York, uh, people with security, political people in New York to take up some of the uh, agenda of, uh, uh, of UNESCO that we consider important. I will give an example with an initiative that at that time Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations launched in uh, 2013, Global Education First Initiative. It was the first time a Secretary General of the United Nations launched such an initiative because everybody thinks New York, UN, it's about peace, security, you don't touch any other thing. So we did convince him, uh, we know because, uh, you know, Korea, the history of uh, uh, Korea after the Korean War and what education brought to that. And he was uh, really a very committed person. And this Education First initiative helped a lot UNESCO and the global education community put education on the global political agenda. So working with the others, I can give, uh, plenty of examples also with culture, with destruction of heritage, how we went to the Security Council and we convinced the Security Council to adopt resolutions to link heritage destruction in Syria, Iraq, uh, Mali with the peace and security agenda. So increasingly so, I believe UNESCO is working with the political constituencies, uh, with the uh, political constituencies in the uh, multilateral system, also in governments, in order to promote uh, the ideas that are deeply into its mandate. Okay, so really interesting. And it relates to another question provided earlier by one of the students. Ashwini, you are here somewhere. You can raise your hand, I see you now. Um, you, uh, the, your question actually relates directly to this one, but perhaps from a different angle. Um, and that is the, the role of the rise perhaps of nationalism in relationship to the multilateralism that you were just talking about. And Ashwini, maybe you can say it uh, yourself, uh, the angle you'd like to take, but I think it follows very nicely on the previous question comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wagner, and thank you, Madam Bokova, uh, for your time. Um, it is actually uh, almost like a follow-up to what you were just sharing with us. Um, I was watching your video, and I realized that um, this in need for multilateralism for right now is very high. But at the same time, we're seeing that a lot of countries, both in the developing regions and the developing countries, have started to look inwards. And that is for different reasons. Like you have Brexit happening, you have Turkey um, trying to have a more hold on their own, um, uh, say, heritage sites, like ha what happened to Hagia Sophia, or India and other countries trying to look inward for economic reasons. So with these challenges coming up, and you were mentioning that um, 
UNESCO is trying to now work with the government, trying to get a more political diplomacy involved. What are the other challenges that uh, an organization like UNESCO is going to face in the current situation? And do you think there's going to be a need to change the strategies or uh, change the method in which UNESCO has been operating so far? Well, thank you for this uh, question. If I knew all the answer, I think it's a million question. Huh? It's uh, um, multilateralism and um, nationalism, unilateralism, uh, as we say, and unfortunately, you're right. Um, I, I think that this uh, tendency uh, started uh, well before the COVID, uh, well before the last, let's say, five years. Uh, there has been uh, uh, this uh, type of, I think it started maybe also um, with the global economic crisis and also the way different countries uh, approached it, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, there was a lot of turmoil uh, with the bailouts of uh, some of the countries uh, that uh, were um, in, uh, in a very severe, I would say, uh, debt uh, faults and, and situation. And this created uh, a lot of resentment uh, in society. Uh, I believe it's not uh, multilateralism to be blamed for that. Um, it is rather the way globalized world worked because globalization gave a huge opportunity for, uh, for millions of people from many countries to develop, uh, to rise out of poverty, uh, but whether uh, globally, globalization also increased inequalities and was done not, uh, I would say, uh, in, in favor of uh, the majority of the people, there is a serious question here to be answered. Um, and this is where I believe uh, some of the problems, uh, some of the problems started. Uh, uh, then of course, uh, COVID-19 uh, now came and it was kind of a scanning of all the deficiencies of the systems uh, that existed within countries and outside countries. And uh, part of the responses, uh, the biggest part of the responses uh, uh, are, are national. Uh, so I'm, I'm very worried about uh, uh, this rise. It's, uh, it's a dead end, uh, in my view. Uh, it's a dead end uh, because we have uh, common challenges. Uh, climate change will not go away with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Even if we solve this problem, it will stay. And they do not know geographical borders or political systems or ethnic belonging, religion differences, whatever. Um, I believe that uh, uh, what the UN, and UNESCO for that matter, I think UNESCO was very, uh, very uh, relevant. The, 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 qu the question here is relevance. It's relevant to the, uh, um, first to the expectations and what the challenges of the moment is. Uh, if the UN uh, and UNESCO and others are relevant uh, to uh, provide answers to some of these questions and to move forward, of course, uh, with the reform, uh, with the, uh, the different ways of uh, the transiting to some kind of another stage. Uh, you know, I, I believe in a constant reform because uh, uh, UN um, system and others, it's like a living organism. They are reforming, they have to adapt to the changing environment. They cannot stay like they were uh, 75 years ago. They have to respond to what people, uh, peoples in the world as the uh, Charter of the United Nations is saying, are expecting. Um, so, uh, I, I, I tend to, to think that uh, if uh, the multilateral system, uh, which is definitely suffering now, um, if countries, uh, members can define, start probably uh, revive, renew, whatever, there are different terms now to say how to, uh, to renew this commitment to multilateralism. I believe there should be some, some areas uh, which definitely are a priority now. Uh, and these uh, are so obvious. It's climate change, uh, it's health, you know, the pandemic, it's the human security generally, uh, I would say uh, nowadays, and maybe a couple of others in the security area, um, armament, uh, negotiations, uh, you know, some agreements. But this is where uh, I believe the UN uh, and, and the system wider should focus. And there, I think we can nowadays, um, get the most, I would say, uh, agreement, consensus, really uh, member states and ideas uh, around this, and then build on that and see how some of the others uh, can, uh, can develop. Um, I know it's, it's not easy because you have to have political will, but um, I see a lot of opportunities there. I mean, if you take climate, 
We have uh, the Biden administration now said we're coming back to the Paris Agreement. We have China that made a very uh, strong also commitment uh, during the General Assembly session. Uh, we have seen also uh, Japan, uh, Korea, um, India, many countries are already jumping uh, into this. We have in Europe the new Green Deal, uh, which uh, we all expect here in Europe really to become a leader uh, in this transition towards a green, uh, safe uh, uh, economies. So I see a lot of good momentum build, being built here. Uh, and of course, the UN should encourage this development and should provide the platform for negotiation. So. Uh, that, that's great. I, I was smiling while you were talking because I was thinking about something that uh, Irina Bokova mentioned uh, before you all came on. And that is she's teaching a class in Paris um, called cultural diplomacy. And I think the kind of phraseology you use is so wonderfully cultural diplomacy. It is so impressive. Uh, um, which leads me to pick on one of the one of the new questions just posted on the chat. Jalen, I'm gonna ask you to ask, uh, I'm gonna ask you to focus on. What happens, I, I, if I understand your question, um, when countries are, to use your word, non-compliant? So what happens if things get difficult, either inside UNESCO or in the UN? Could you put that in your own words, Jalen? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much for coming, um, Madam Bokova. Uh, it, it's interesting because a lot of like, what I study in undergrad was more security focused. And so coming to graduate school, being focused on the social side is, it's been really unique. But one thing I remember is the Security Council always has those countries who are non-compliant. And it's likewise for a lot of the UN agencies. Um, and I got, we got to watch the video about when uh, Tillerson pulled out of UNESCO and your response to that. Um, and so I just wanted to know how UNESCO personally deals with countries who are non-compliant. Um, and if you could let us inside maybe uh, some of those frustrating moments for you personally uh, that maybe others didn't get to see, that would be really rich. Um, it's, uh, it's a very uh, interesting question uh, saying that countries are not complying. Um, it depends, of course, uh, non-complying with, uh, with what kind of a document, uh, because uh, UNESCO does not have, uh, as I said, Security Council. There are no uh, decisions, there are no sanctions or uh, uh, some kind of uh, coercive measures. But uh, I think the wide variety of um, legal instruments, for example, if we speak about uh, culture, because the UNESCO is the holder of the uh, legal framework uh, for uh, heritage protection, culture, um, illicit trafficking uh, objects and all this. Uh, I think there are uh, specific mechanisms where uh, you could, um, I wouldn't say name and shame a country, but still you can uh, use uh, some soft diplomacy in order to make a country comply uh, with this. Um, I think the, um, probably the most difficult part of it, uh, as you said, is to, uh, in a very uh, soft, uh, in a diplomatic way, um, make a country uh, adopt and accept uh, certain uh, values, uh, certain provisions. And I think this is also the beauty of it because I, I believe that uh, societies are transformed from within when they accept some ideas. It's very difficult to from outside to impose something. You can, you can try, you may of course um, uh, have some limited success, but the long-term sustainable success is when societies are transformed within this, within, within themselves. And this is where uh, I think the soft power of UNESCO is, uh, is very, very instrumental. I can give you an example with the gender equality or some uh, countries which are, uh, have uh, discriminatory uh, legislation or practices against women. Uh, and all of them are members uh, on, on, on equal footing with others. But working with these countries, um, trying to convince them, showcasing uh, why they, uh, they will be benefiting even from such a change as a societies, as communities, uh, uh, and seeing them 
embrace these values and changing is an extremely rewarding experience. Um, and uh, in very many of the other areas, let's uh, take the area of uh, freedom of speech, for example, which UNESCO also has uh, as a mandate. Um, um, UNESCO has a, a price on the freedom of speech and uh, uh, it is probably sometimes a controversial issue because you give a price uh, to somebody who is in jail a uh, journalist who is in jail or who has been liberated from jail, or I have been working in, in such cases, um, uh, give a price to somebody who is in jail. And then at the same time, you work with the government, uh, convince them that they have to release this journalist because it's not in the, their own interest of their own development, uh, not just in it, but uh, wider, I would say. And I think these are these moments which are not uh, always uh, in the forefront. You cannot, um, showcase this, you cannot, uh, because at the end of the day, diplomacy is also about uh, working uh, uh, in a more confidential manner uh, sometimes, but achieving uh, good results. Uh, so I think UNESCO has uh, a lot of uh, leverage, a lot of opportunities for change without necessarily sanctioning uh, somebody as the Security Council uh, has it. Yeah, very, very interesting. So um, another question that sort of pushes on the same sort of what, um, how does UNESCO see itself in the UN system? Uh, Brandon, I see you on my screen and you asked a question, a really good question that should always be asked at moments like this. What about the money? What about budget? How does that, and I'm, uh, you can phrase it, Brandon, how you like, you have to go off of mute. But I think it's always, uh, you know, the old expression, follow the money. Um, so how would you phrase your question? Um, yeah, so just one thing that stood out to me when in thinking about all the different effects of the global pandemic uh, was particularly the economic effects since that will um, have some sort of impact on all the different actors <clears throat> in development. And so my question is, um, how do you think uh, this will impact the capacity to actually implement educational projects and programs across these different um, stakeholders. And um, particularly, I was thinking about the digital divide, as you mentioned, as being one of the most pressing concerns, but also one of the more costly to address within education. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's a so relevant question uh, nowadays from all different perspectives. Uh, the financing, uh, of course, uh, financing of uh, multilateral organizations, uh, different uh, programs uh, and projects. And uh, my, my worry is that um, on two different levels, uh, the financing of education uh, will be limited and will go down. And we're seeing this already happening. Uh, if we speak about uh, international development aid, um, you know that the target that has been uh, put uh, is to have uh, developed countries, which is by OECD a target set long time ago, that 0.7% of uh, uh, the uh, GDP of a country should go to international development aid. And unfortunately, there are rarely countries uh, that uh, uh, are uh, achieving this, uh, this goal. Uh, Norway is probably the only country that has 1%. UK until recently had it, 07 and recently they announced that because of the COVID, because of the changing environment and all this, they're going down. And I'm afraid that it will happen with the most of the donor countries. On the other side, it is also the national budgets. Because of the crisis, the national budgets are shrinking. And the, uh, some of the, uh, I, I mentioned uh, some of the figures about education, uh, and I'm afraid that uh, if education is not looked as a, one of the uh, primary investment uh, for the future, we may have a lost generation into the making uh, in globally, uh, I would say. Uh, and this indeed will endanger very many of the uh, projects and, uh, and ideas uh, that uh, we're having. So um, this is a matter of uh, uh, political will, I think. It is also a matter of uh, uh, good uh, uh, economics to invest in education. Uh, and at the end of the day, it, in my view, it's a matter of uh, peace and prosperity for the world. Um, if we don't invest in education, and recently there was a very interesting proposal by uh, 
a former commissioner of the European Union, Mario Monti, who was uh, uh, also, he's now a president of Bocconi University and others. And he was saying that uh, what is needed nowadays is an investment in education to the proportion of the Marshall Plan after the Second World War, if we really want uh, to make this transition uh, of the uh, economies uh, after the pandemics. And unfortunately, I'm worried, but I don't see this even in the best of the plans. Um, so interesting. Um, one question that relates to this, uh, and the and I would say pushing a little further on Brandon's question, would be how do you see uh, still following the money in the budget and the financing? Um, how did you see your time as director general um, uh, dealing with budget issues when some countries and some other UN specialized agencies, let's say UNICEF, World Bank, UNDP and others, um, how did you see the role of UNESCO in the constellation of UN specialized agency? What was the value added you alluded to one or mentioned one, which is that, um, you know, it's really an intergovernmental has larger reach, perhaps larger opportunities for innovation in some ways, but it's always been a, a my sense of things, it's always been a struggle around resources, having enough human resources and budgetary resources to have the kind of impact that matched the, the mission that had, I think in some ways UNESCO has the best mission of all. It's, exactly. Uh, but it doesn't have the resources typically to respond to that mission. How do you see that now, maybe then and now in retrospect? Any further thoughts on that? Because that's a question that's hard to ask you to find time to answer. This is a moment. It would be very interesting for us to hear your thoughts. Um, I, I believe you are entirely right that the uh, budget and the financing uh, does not live up to the ambitions uh, in any case. Um, the uh, mandate UNESCO is so wide. Um, it covers uh, from culture and education and sciences, uh, communication now, uh, freedom of speech, uh, uh, training of journalists. So it's, uh, it's really wide. And I would say oceans, I forgot to mention also oceans because of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, the science about the oceans. So it's, uh, it's really wide. Uh, and uh, I have seen uh, uh, during the years, and I have been making research with my predecessors, uh, how indeed uh, budget was shrinking and uh, uh, with the suspension uh, and then uh, uh, when the United States left UNESCO and stopped paying its dues, uh, I think the budget is uh, probably smaller than uh, an average American university, to be very frank. I don't know your Penn's budget, but uh, no. uh, definitely it's, uh, it's a very, very modest budget against uh, the expectations. The good news is that uh, there are a lot of extra budgetary resources. And very many countries are contributing. Uh, now it's almost uh, equals, even uh, uh, surpasses the regular budget. Uh, for different kinds of programs. Uh, of course, there is always a danger of um, ownership of different projects and who is actually setting the uh, priorities for an organization when you have an extra budgetary support of it. So I would say uh, balancing between these two has always been a challenge and I assume it is still a challenge uh, at UNESCO. But unless there is a predictable uh, financing, a predictable budget, uh, I think always there will be lack of resources, uh, lack of uh, either human resources or others. And uh, uh, it is really sad uh, to see uh, this uh, wonderful uh, agency with the mandate, as we always say, the smart, the smart, the soft power of the United Nations uh, being uh, uh, so much dependent and always on the verge of uh, collapsing because of these financial difficulties. Great, so there is actually a question that directly follows from this. Bikalpa, I saw you earlier. Can you sort of show your hand here? Yeah, hi. Okay, great. And your question, if you don't mind framing it um, a little bit related to this issue that uh, you talk about, um, you know, who's collecting data for, for which purposes, that does relate, I think, to this issue of budget and financing, but how would you phrase it yourself? Yeah, uh, so right now I'm interning at UNESCO. And this is a question that I've had, like, 
like just working in university and reading studies and like re reading at results of different projects. It's like a lot of times, like one of the main conclusions is just like we need more data to make better, better decision. But like a lot of times, like having more data has a lot of administrative challenges, a lot of the like, ethical challenges. So I was wondering, like, uh, how should we as like future future workers in this field like think about balancing like the demand for more data from like funders or like research research community like the demand for like balancing demand for more data with like the realities of like just like administrative challenges or even like ethical challenges mm. very interesting question it's actually the first time i confront with this question although it's so relevant uh, to uh, uh, to the debate um let me say uh, that um the uh, issue about the data the lack of data uh, was put uh, very strongly within the United Nations during the work of the Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, it was uh, recognized at that time that uh, in order to make the right policies, you have to know what is happening. You have to know, you have to have the data, you have to know uh, what is happening in education system or in some others. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, the question was only about the big data. So we have this big data, you know, about uh, uh, budgets and GDPs and big trends and others. But you cannot make the right policies if you don't have a segregated data. And this is where the devil comes. Because take, for example, the question about girls' education or gender equality. Unless you go to a segregated data to see actually what is happening, you will never understand and go to the, uh, I would say, nitty gritty of what you should do in order to make, you know, this gender equality happen or uh, girls going to school and the others. So this is when, at that time, I remember Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, he set a big uh, commission uh, on, uh, on data uh, collection and all this. Uh, and the idea with the adoption of the Agenda 2015 was to make governments uh, set because in some countries there is no uh, tradition, there is no experience in setting statistical data. So, for example, in education, UNESCO was helping many countries uh, with the uh, International Statistical Institute um, in, uh, uh, in Canada and Montreal and others. And I myself have opened probably four or five uh, offices, statistical offices in ministries of education in Africa. So, um, this really became a big issue. Uh, to be very frank, I don't know now what is uh, the um, exact uh, situation, how it is uh, being, uh, how it is developing, but uh, uh, it was uh, um, one of those important drivers of the development, uh, uh, pillars, I would say, of right policies to have the right data. If you don't have the right data, you just, you, you will be wrong, maybe. You take policies and they do not have an impact. So this is where the importance of data. Uh, thank you for that. I have, um, uh, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't give you enough time to talk about issues around gender, something that you have spent uh, large amounts of time on. And I, I think um, uh, we do have a question from actually from Rachel Phipps, who I saw a little earlier. Rachel, can you wave your hand here? Um, I'd like if I could ask you, Rachel, to say your your question, but say it perhaps in in the sense of, um, I'm going to lead this question a little bit. That is, you know, what are the, I don't mean to put words into your mouth exactly, but I, I'd like you to ask the question about what, around what you th think are the most important questions now, today, as opposed to maybe 10 years ago. And how would you phrase that question? Yeah, definitely. Um, so thank you so much for being here and for being so generous with your knowledge and time. My question was specifically centered on the SDGs and focusing in on gender. I was wondering through your lived experiences as well as your various positions, especially with UNESCO, um, which of the SDGs do you believe have been most positively impacted by working to get out of school K through 12 students back into schools. So specifically, I was thinking of number one, no poverty, but also number five with gender equality. Um, and then if there's any other SDGs you wanna to speak to. So in other words, how can we get the masses or other entities on board with really pushing to get out of school children back into school and what impact does this have on gender equality today? 
Ah, very important question because it's really it's into the intersection between uh, um, education, uh, poverty, uh, gender equality, um, um, I would say a social inclusion. Um, and um, and uh, what, what I think from, from my point of view, uh, what, is, uh, what is important is that um, um, the SDG agenda, uh, of course, uh, is adopted by governments, but uh, it is not just an agenda for the governments. Uh, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which were more limited, uh, they were adopted in a different way, uh, they were more aspirational, and um, there were civil society was not that much uh, linked to it, um, private sector not at all. I think uh, the difference is that the SDG agenda was elaborated by everybody, everybody was there governments, academia, civil society, private sector, everybody made an effort because the challenges today uh, can't be solved only by, by the governments. We can't solve the problem with climate change if the private sector is not there. It's more than obvious. Um, uh, we, we can't uh, uh, solve the problem of, of, of poverty uh, if we don't have both uh, civil society, private sector, governments, everybody. So it's, uh, it's really uh, the uh, collective effort of, 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 of all. Uh, and just to give an example, and then I come back to your question, look now at what is happening with climate, uh, for not only climate inequalities and others with the private sector. Maybe it's not that huge, although I think it's accelerated, but the private sector, the big banks and others are asking themselves a question, what is the purpose of our activity? Is it only profit? No, it is not. It is really about society. It is about how we can contribute to society. Now with the COVID and with the climate, all the drive, there is an explosion of green investment and the trend is going exponentially uh, around the world. So uh, my point is that um, the SDG agenda uh, is indeed about everybody. And there are so many ways of uh, contributing uh, to it. Uh, particularly now, I believe after COVID, there should be once again a review and to see in education with the poverty, kids out of school, uh, because we know the World Bank has given uh, really an alarming figures about poverty that is uh, uh, scourging and also that some of the kids that were in the lockdown will not go back to school. Uh, and there are about more than 30 million, uh, as the World Bank has indicated. If they don't go to school, after this, it means no meals for them because many of them get their meals in school also. They will not uh, get the uh, skills further on and they will just reproduce poverty. Um, I think now we really need to think creatively about um, uh, how to once again uh, mobilize um, all the existing uh, resources uh, around it um, in order to catch up a little bit Maybe technology can help in some remote areas uh, uh, with the very different uh, innovation uh, solutions. But uh, I think we first, we have to do two things. We have to catch up the unfinished business or the business that uh, has been uh, damaged, I would say, uh, by uh, the COVID uh, with the poverty and others, and then to look. And at the same time, because Dan asked this question, I think that the impact on gender equality is devastating. Uh, with the COVID. And we have seen that in so many circumstances. Um, and nowadays we see that the impact on women, the United Nations women has uh, rang the bell. It's about the job losses. It's about poverty once again. Uh, it's about girls not going to school. It's about early marriages. Um, um, they say that there will be uh, only in Africa, 1 million and 1.5 million more early marriages because of that. Uh, so all the, I would say, negative impact of, uh, of poverty and this backlash will come and will uh, we'll just push back our achievements. And um, it is uh, heartbreaking to see uh, what is happening there. Uh, yeah, it is indeed. Uh, so maybe one, another question related directly to education. Amrita, you had a question about the pandemic and teachers, right? Would you like to, now that we've heard what the Madame Bokova was saying, would you like to maybe have a follow-up question around teacher issues in the pandemic? 
Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Wagner. And thank you so much, Madam Bokova, for all the knowledge you're sharing. Um, similarly to what Dr. Wagner was saying and to what you alluded to when you were talking, as a result of the pandemic, there's been like this rise in interest and investment into online education and ed tech, for, which is education technology for short. So you can see so many people trying to capitalize on that. But in many developing countries, like you mentioned, teachers might not be properly trained to, help, to effectively use these online platforms of learning if they even have access to it. So moving forward, how do you think this high investment of say like private sectors in, or just civil society into online education will be balanced with the struggle of effectively implementing it on the ground within teachers and students and, and, and schools itself? Um, I'm, I'm very happy that you ask a question about teachers because I think teachers, uh, um, all by all the uh, technology and achievement teachers will stay forever and nothing can substitute a good teacher. Um, I think what is needed nowadays when we speak about the pandemic uh, uh, is not only supporting uh, children, students, uh, but it's supporting teachers and unfortunately not much talk about it uh, because the conventional wisdom goes that you put a computer and the teacher is there and you zoom and everything's fine and I don't believe this. I think teachers uh, should be supported uh, and uh, I don't have here figures but uh, I know that uh, a vast majority of teachers in the developing countries were just left uh, left alone uh, without uh, any kind of guidance uh, or a support. So if we want to have really an effective um, strategy, digital strategy uh, for education, teachers should be part of it. Uh, teachers should, should be uh, um, uh, kind of trained for that. Uh, uh, they have to know how to use all these uh, innovative uh, platforms uh, because it's one thing uh, is to uh, teach uh, uh, in presence in school. Another thing is uh, uh, teaching um, on, the, on the screen. Uh, and uh, as I said, the role of the teachers is not just passing information nowadays, it's very different. And I guess it's much more even difficult to instill this type of uh, um, values, of, of guidance uh, that uh, we want to do. So definitely uh, teachers uh, should be there. And um, I'm happy that UNESCO is continuing uh, with very strong cooperation with the uh, Education International, the biggest um, um, association of, of teachers that are doing a lot of good work on supporting teachers. And, and this, is, this is critical, vital. As I said, technology will not substitute a teacher. It's good we have it, huh? I'm not at all, I'm very enthusiastic about it, but it doesn't mean that the teacher is becoming all of a sudden somewhere obsolete. Um, so many interesting questions um, and I can see our, we're just about out of time and I want to make sure that I ask one more question in a way, uh, trying to put myself in the shoes of some of the students, maybe even most of the students uh, who are tuning in to hear you today. Um, and that is if you had two or three uh, ideas about what groups of students like the ones that are listening to you tuning in from the University of Pennsylvania and from around the world here, um, what would be your, if they were sitting with you having a cup of tea, maybe on Boulevard Saint-Germain or maybe in Fontenoy where you- Unfortunately, were... everything is closed nowadays in the long time. <laughs> I know, I know. Sadly, I was bringing Don't it up. Don't tease me. <laughs> only nostalgically, of course. But, um, but in, and they were coming to you for advice. You know, what should I do in a world like this? We're in a pandemic. I'm getting a master's degree or maybe a PhD, but mainly a master's degree in this call. Um, how should I think about my future? What are the opportunities? Um, if you had two or three thoughts, uh, I don't know if this is even possible question to ask you, but I think people will remember what you say. So um, just wondering if you might have that. Uh, imagine you were only with one of the students. Um, what would you say? Well, it's, it's difficult indeed, but um, I, I usually am an optimistic person. I'm not uh, somebody that is um, 
uh, giving in. And um, I, I think uh, that the opportunities uh, in this wonderful, beautiful world, uh, much more than the challenges we have. Um, I think um, for the students, uh, they have to embrace the change. They have to live with the change because the change probably is the most constant. Uh, uh, I think some of the great philosophers have said it uh, um, centuries ago. It's probably the only permanent thing that we have nowadays in life. So um, on that basis, um, I think to set um, a very clear um, kind of uh, priorities uh, for themselves, so something that uh, uh, is a passion, something that really uh, you are committed to and you think that you can uh, make an impact uh, uh, to have kind of a confidence uh, into this. And what I think is probably one of the most difficult part of it, but so necessary um, from my own experience also, uh, is to try to convince the others to build coalitions, uh, to work with the others, uh, so to make an impact. Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, you may be uh, right, you may believe in the cause and the cause may be the most beautiful and uh, you know, lofty, but you have to convince also the others uh, and to make this kind of a coalition to build uh, and, uh, and to move on. So I think this will be my advice uh, for the students. Well, I know nowadays young people are much smarter than us huh? then they know how to, uh, how to do it, but this is my experience. Well, I think that's a wonderful way to draw this to a close. And you are, I think, from our perspective, even from the global perspective, a, a treasure of uh, knowledge and commitment and humility and uh, commitment. And the word I want to end with, and the one that you alluded to, too, and I see people clapping, which is a great thing, is the passion that you've had over a lifetime of work and continue to have uh, is something that uh, is so important. Um, and I would say this, just to add, you know, I think that's the, the piece. If you can be persistent and go with those changes that Irina Bokova was talking about is something to bear in mind if you have to underline something from this uh, multifaceted and very rich conversation. So on behalf of all of us, we thank you, Irina Bokova, again, for joining us at Penn. We hope to see you in person before too long. And we wish you to take care and be well. And thank you for your guidance and your thoughts. Thank you very much. Very, very generous. Thank you all and good luck to you. Good luck. The world really is beautiful outside. So you are the one to change it. Thank you very much.